Welcome to episode number 41 of the danjohnuniversity.com podcast. Uh, yes, it's true. I do have some new art behind me. Thank you, Amy, so much. So let's begin right away. We have a question from Amazia, which is a great name. Do you have any tips on increasing pull-ups reps past 10? Um, I hope there's a good reason to do them past 10, but let's continue. I've been doing some of your lower rep programs with extra weight, the 3211, with the extra 10 kilos, but I'm not seeing much progress with that method. Well, um, of course, I'm a big believer that once you get past 10 in the pull-up, you should just add load uh, because that's the kind of people I work with in my in my in when I consult or when I do uh, coaching. Uh, to increase the sheer number of reps you do, first off, and there's another question coming right up about this, beware of middle age pull-up syndrome. Uh, it's kind of like tennis elbow. Once you get that pain here, uh, it doesn't want to go away. It's a tough one. Um, there's two basic things I'd recommend. The first is kind of the standard thing. Uh, if you have a pull-up bar inside your house, uh, put it in front of your bathroom or your kitchen, and every time you go in the room, uh, do some pull-ups and just try to increase the total number of pull-ups you do throughout the day. That really seems to work. It is like learning to type. You're teaching your nervous system. This is what we do when our hands are on a bar. The second thing is what I recommend to my military friends, and that is to increase your hang times and your hang time with the flex arm, the straight arm hang and the flex arm hang. Uh, one of the reasons you might not be improving your pull-up is you don't have the specific strength of being maybe right here. Oddly, and, and this is something I think is true, um, some people have improved their press, their kettlebell press, by doing more waiter walks. It seems that if you get strong here on the press and you get strong there, stable and strong, you're, the body figures out what to do in the middle. I think that is absolutely true with the pull-up. More hang on the straight arm, more hang on the flex arm. Uh, I do want to make sure you have a good reason for increasing your number of pull-ups. Like, for example, if you there are some fire departments, I understand, demand 25 pull-ups for the recruits. And I can understand training up to that. If I was going to train up for that, I would recommend trying to train to 35 pull-ups so you have a big cushion when you take the test. Um, those are two good pieces of advice. Uh, Please get back to me and tell me how either one of them works for you. Thank you. We have a question from Rob. In podcast number 38, you made a glancing reference to pain associated with MAPS, middle age pull-up syndrome. Understanding your usual caveats about not being a doctor and not giving medical advice, I'm going to come right back to that point. I'd like to ask you if you have any ideas to address inner elbow pain as a result of pull-up work. Uh, first thing. Uh, someone posted something on my Instagram account. I made a slight reference to my hip replacement and they went on, I, I deleted it, but they went on this thing about what kind of doctors you should look for and, and gave advice about what the appropriate kind of medical intervention. I'm thinking there, how can you sitting there in Fargo, North Dakota, tell the entire 7 billion people on this planet Earth what the right hip procedures are. Uh, I like to go to something I call a doctor, someone who went to something called a medical school. And those are the people I get advice from when it comes to surgeries. Uh, I don't, for example, recommend drinking Clorox because I'm not a doctor. Oh, and I'm not an idiot. Um, having said that, I don't have any good advice for you, Rob. Uh, the only thing that's I've ever seen work, and actually it's interesting because I was at lunch with uh, Greg Glassman years ago, and we discussed this. Once you get this, and he said the same thing I did, the only thing that seems to help is not doing pull-ups. So this is one of those injuries, kind of like patella tendonitis. That's the that's that uh, tendon right below your kneecap. Uh, patella tendonitis and this MAPS, are those are the two injuries. Once you get them, you, have, you own it. You know, the other one too is shin splints. And again, someone told me that there's 22 theories about what shin splints are and they all disagree with each other. Uh, so it's one of those things where make sure if you're going to do a pull-up 
program that you're very smart, that the thing I've noticed with myself and in conversations with other people is it's when you're struggling to get that one more, uh, you've done 12 pull-ups and your fight fight to 13 for no good reason at all. That's when things seem to get in the way. So Rob, I, I don't have good advice besides rest uh, once you get this. And rest means you might not do pull-ups for weeks and weeks and weeks. When you come back, try the hanging program where you just straight arm hang for a while because that won't put any stress on your elbow. And you'll have to test to see if the flexed arm hang hurts your elbow. So that's two pull-up questions back to back, which is kind of interesting. Oh, we got a question from Lisa. Hi, Lisa. I'm halfway through the Easy Strength Olympic program. You can find that on the site, Dan John University. We have it in an article form and on the bus bench program and loving it. Well, thank you, Lisa. Good feedback. Being a complete newbie to the Olympic lifts and having an idiot for a coach, <laughs> she says, moi, uh, I have a few questions. Uh, we'll do our best to help coach you. Is the squat catch position a technical requirement for calling something an Olympic lift, or is it just a skill you would need to master to allow you to lift competitive amounts of weights? You know, Lisa, that's a much more complex question than you think. Um, in my career, I always liked my throwers to do squat snatches, but I was always fine with the power clean. Um, if you're going to compete on the platform, you want to squat snatch and squat clean both events because you don't have to pull the bar as high, which allows you really to lift a lot more. So Lisa, in your case, maybe just doing the power variations is enough. Basically, can I say I'm doing Olympic lifts if I don't catch it in a full squat? Um, you have my permission, Lisa. And anybody who says those aren't Olympic lifts, you, you, you wiggle that finger right at them like this and you say, my good friend Dan John says it's okay. And then she goes on to say, there are purists out there who love to quibble. And that's true. Uh, the interesting thing is if you go to a, a master's weightlifting meet, you'll see that the realities of life make a lot of master lifters do all kinds of interesting things um, that uh, are a little different than what you see at the Olympic Games. Question two from Lisa. When doing snatches as part of a complex, would you recommend using a slightly narrower grip uh, to allow lowering the bar under control without needing to, to adjust the grip in the hang position? You really need to learn to control the bar on the descent. Uh, I know this generation with everybody uh, using bumper plates, everyone's gotten used to just dropping the bar. I still think there's some value. That eccentric, the, the downward, I think really does help you overall with your strength. So I would like you to keep your hands in your snatch grip position. Um, for work sets of snatches, I have a wide grip and then drop the bar to a clean position and roll it down to the floor for the next rep. And then slide your hands back out. That's that's fine. That was, I'm fine with that. In the complexes, you're going to be going rep after rep after rep after rep after rep. But if you bring it down like that, I'm fine. In fact, the great Soviet lifter David Rieger used to do it like that, and a lot of people about my age still do that because we copied that. Uh, I'm working in my lounge room, so dropping the bar from on high is not something I want to do too often, if at all. Yeah. I'm fine with that on those high reps, uh, pardon me, on those quality Olympic uh, reps. But on the complexes, keep your hands out, okay? Thank you. And Lisa, I would like to hear how you're doing on this over time. And we have a third question. And for both snatches and cleans, what grip style do you recommend? And how should my grip be on the clean part? Easiest thing I know, grab a broomstick, okay? and stand as tall as you can, squeeze your butt cheeks, make sure your, your uh, pelvic bowl is level, and then slide your hands out on that broomstick until the broomstick touches where your belt would be, uh, your belt buckle would be. That's gonna be your snatch grip. Uh, it's weird because my snatch grip is wider than the collars. Uh, at meet sometimes I, I would stand up, and it still happens, with just my index finger and thumb still on the bar and these three fingers starting to slide out on the collar. 
because that's that's what happens when I catch it. Um, now, with your hands in that position, mark it, and that's what you're going to use when you use, put it on the Olympic bar, and then slide your hands in until your outstretched thumbs touch the outsides of your thighs. By the way, neither is going to be perfect, perfect, but generally I found in my career that thumbs on the thighs position, that's about where you want your clean grip to be. And uh, broomstick on the belt buckle is where you want your snatch grip to be, generally. Uh, people are born a little different. Uh, I'm working with a young man with extremely long arms and short tor torso, very much like me. And it's kind of interesting to see the struggles finding a snatch grip with someone with a shorter torso and longer arms. I hope that helps. Stay in touch. We have a question from Tim. I have a question about deadlifting. I usually deadlift heavy for me about once a week, but I have a reoccurring problem that whenever I progress to about twice body weight for a set of five, which is a good lift, I find I can hardly sleep that night, night before, often getting only two or three hours. It can also affect the following night as well. This obviously impacts my recovery and quality of life and usually results in stalling on the deadlift or my getting frustrated and axing it from my program completely for a while. Is this a common problem? Have you found any solutions to this? So I have an Olympic lifting program called the Big 21. In fact, we were just discussing it today in this morning's workout. And workouts one, two, and three are hard. Uh, the next week, four, five, and six are much harder. And my athletes often struggle the night before with an odd kind of nervousness uh, for the last three workouts, seven, eight, nine. Uh, eight's got to be the toughest because you still have one more after it. Um, I think for short periods of time, lack of sleep is something we all have to put up with. If you have children, it's going to happen. If you decide to babysit, it's going to happen. Life is going to sometimes punch you in the face. But this is kind of unusual with deadlifting because deadlifting is generally so much more of an aggressive, high arousal, high tension kind of move. Um, one thing I'd like you to think about, Tim, is maybe, maybe you need to practice. So it seems like with your numbers, you understand high arousal and high tension. What you might not be understanding is low, low arousal and low tension. I mean, do you need a hot tub the night before you, you deadlift? Do you need to do some meditation tapes? Do you need to, and that's one thing about meditation. It is a practice. You must practice it to get the benefits out of it. Uh, I, I went from one minute a day up to now I can go for 15 minutes without falling sound asleep. So, but I think that's the area we want to look at. I don't think it's a reps and sets thing. I'm wondering if you you need to control your arousal a little bit better. Um, if you've always been a bit of a, a, a nervous guy, maybe, I don't know, this might be uh, uh, an interesting thing. Uh, a buddy of mine who famously failed miserably at several Olympics, you know, he candidly one time said, you know, he had always had problems with pressure. And even though he was a magnificent athlete, his ability to get into the right place at the biggest championships was truly compromised. And he, and he mentioned it, it was always a problem with him. And I thought to myself, well, that's interesting because I feel if you know there's an issue, we can do steps to engage and deal with it. So I would like you to think, <laughs> it's a little different advice than you probably thought I was going to give you, but I'd like you to look at consciously learning to be better at relaxation and maybe meditation. Uh, there's plenty of stuff online. I use brain.fm. I use one the app, One Moment Meditation, but there's tons of stuff on YouTube. There's TED Talks. There's, uh, there's all kinds of meditation tapes and music. Try something that simple, okay? And Tim, that's a good deadlift. Have a good day. Dave says, I have heard you talk about the benefits of rack pulls instead of pulling from the floor. Yeah, with my taller athletes, yeah. I am slightly vertically challenged, five foot seven, but would like your advice on whether I should benefit more in the long run, longevity, I'm 53, so Dave is 53 years old, pulling from the floor, or would benefit more from the rack. Thanks for all you do to help the many. 
Yeah. You know, Dave, this is one of those times it would be nice for you to have a, a good coach, a good coach eye your deadlift technique. If you're basically doing a leg press hinge, so leg press hinge, um, <clears throat> you at your height that maybe you have long arms, you the deadlift might be the perfect tool in your in your kit at 5'7. Now, if you round back it and then you do all that weird this kind of shaking like this. Uh, I don't know for longevity if that's going to be a good idea. So you need to get someone to watch you, or you could video it and uh, post it, post it like on a YouTube, and then put that YouTube link on the uh, the forum in uh, danjohnuniversity.com. What we can do is we can look at it and maybe uh, with a few other sets of eyes and give you some feedback. Um, at 5'7", there's a good chance the bar is perfectly perfect on the ground for you. Um, if it's not, we're only talking about a marginal amount to get that in the right place for you. But I would like to see it if possible. Thank you, Dave. And I hope that helps other people too. Gary writes us, I'm a 40-year-old man who does line work for the power company. So you're a lineman for the county. And you, and you drive the main roads. Sorry, Glenn Campbell. Currently, my work days are 12 hours long, six days a week with a three-hour commute round trip. I am also recovering from the coronavirus. So, uh, Gary, other than that, any issues? Uh, before I got six, my, sick, my primary training consisted of kettlebells, uh, snatches, carries, and uh, overhead press variations, and jujitsus. I always felt worn down. How can I train effectively without breaking down my body? an immune system and make progress. Um, yeah, right now, nothing. Uh, you're recovering from a virus. Um, after a three hour commute, uh, I don't, I don't know how you have any time left in the day. Uh, you, you need, you need to sleep. You need to, you need to take, you need to take care of yourself. I mean, just the work, your workload, your travel schedule for a while, Gary, you're just going to have to turn the engines off. Uh, if you decide, you know, downstream when you feel better and you start to get the bounce back in your step, um, certainly I, I, I like the idea of you doing, if these are kettlebells, try something as simple as uh, uh, press and goblet squat for a while. Press, goblet squat, and uh, maybe suitcase carry. Something that simple. But keep everything shrunken down for a while. Uh, I'm concerned about your schedule and your issues with the coronavirus. Um, you, you might have to maybe move closer or... This this is tough. I, I don't want you to start to write checks now that you're not going to be able to cash in a few years. Uh, generally, um, you got to take it easy, okay, Gary? Uh, and recover from the virus. Feel When you feel good again, consider doing something as simple as and I would even consider half kneeling presses, goblet squats, and suitcase carries. Just that for a while. Get yourself feeling good. That'll provide a little bit of hypertrophy work, but it'll also provide some flexibility work. It'll work your, whatever you want to call the core this week. Uh, that's about all I can recommend for now. And then down the ways here, let's, let's think maybe a month or two. Uh, let's talk again and let's come up with some ideas. Now you've got to recover. You need your sleep. You need good food. You need some. You need to get your water up. You need to feel good. You need to feed that virus. Thank you, Gary. We have a question from Jason. I read a lot of your work, Jim Wendler's and Mark Ripito's, among others. I feel like all of you end up more or less in the same place, and that all of you always come back to the same lifts: press, bench, squat, and deadlift. I feel like you include more kettlebell work. Yeah, and. They back squat, knife front squat, and overhead squat. But yeah, I, yeah, I agree with you. I am experiencing paralysis by analysis, uh, which happens to everybody, yeah, but okay. I am having trouble programming my workouts with consistency. I would like to focus on strength and mobility with whatever size coming as a bonus. I've also began experimenting with rucking, but not sure about weight progression. Uh, yeah, don't go over 35 pounds and just go do it and slowly build up the amount of time that you go and the distance. 
Basically, I don't want to end up a tired old man. Any help, suggestions for long-term progress would be greatly appreciated. Yeah, uh, you're reading Jim Wendler. Just do just do the five three one, and include, you know, maybe depending on your situation. Uh, if you decide to do the four day option, which I think is really good for adults, uh, where you do uh, the military press and uh, practice the other three, and then do conditioning. I think there's real value. This is a good program. Uh, so I would do Jim Wendler's 531, a variation that works in your life, and then follow his ideas about conditioning. And really it's gonna come down to basically what we do. I do two hard rucks a week, hard. I do two one hour rucks a week under fairly good load, and I try to walk every day. That's about where you want to be on this, okay? Um, one thing I would try to do, if I were you also, Jason, is try not to read. <laughs> One, once you're doing a program, don't don't read other programs. Don't be a program switcher. Uh, try to finish something. Uh, try to do Jim's program for three months and get back to me. I think you'll be very happy with what happens. Well, that's episode 41 of the DanJohnUniversity.com podcast. Now listen, email us at podcast at danjohnuniversity.com and I'm going to do my very best to answer each and every question. Thank you so much and stay healthy.